We have uh, until um, 4.30. Mm. So we've got three quarters of an hour to try and do some justice to a, an amazing array of issues that have been discussed. And I thought the, the best way to capture the wisdom up here and to put the experiences of these legends through the prism of today's challenges is to, first of all, just connect that in our careers, there have been four revolutions, none of which are sedentary, and they're all continuing. Globalization, sustainable development, digitalization, and energy transformation, all thoroughly interconnected, all thoroughly interdependent, and they're all on a path of continuous improvement. One of the common things for our industry is for all of our cognizance that we are a cyclical industry, our capacity to manage those cycles, particularly through a counter-cyclical approach to investment and technological adoption is, if I may say so, a fault line in our development, to put it in mining terms. And as one uh, very close colleague of mine says, what you're saying is we suck. And that's pretty right when you think about it. So my first question to the panel, and I'm going to start with my mate Owen, is you've been through the cycles. You've seen it come and go. You've seen the supply side. You've seen the markets looking at us. You've seen the capital markets working backwards, the product markets. The markets are acting rationally. They always do, but they're even more rational today. And the longer term consideration of what we're doing. So in your illustrious career and your experiences, how would you look at the environment that we're in today and the context of what happened before and where we're going? We won't do the full Monty at the moment about what the, what's happening, the challenges and the solutions, what have you, but just the whole concept of the industry's approach to cycles, countless cyclical activity, and how it manages it. Well, thank you, Mitch, for that opening, and, and thank you very much for the first question. So, um, look, and, and I should say thank you indeed for the opportunity to have a bit of a go here today because I think it's uh, just an amazing event. Ten years, congratulations to Jennifer and the whole of the, uh, the IMARC team. Just an amazing performance, ten years at it, great registrations and a, and a wonderful conference and indeed living proof that the industry is, is in very good shape, very good hands uh, and the technical and uh, displays out, out here just fantastic. So well done to, uh, to 10 years of, of IMARC. Great performance. So Mitch, uh, in terms of answering uh, that question, I think, and, and you know, the market always clearing and, and what in your experience, uh, I should say one of, one of the, the, the favourite quotes that I have about experience uh, is experience is what enables you to recognise a mistake when you make it for the second and third time. <laughs> But in terms of our uh, outlook, I mean, we think, and, and uh, we're all in the industry here one way or the other, we think we're in for sort of long-term uh, increase in demand in, in uh, commodities uh, and mineral products generally out over multiple decades here. You're just seeing the expansion in uh, continuing in China, continuing in Asia, and all of the other developing uh, countries around the world all chipping in. So you will continue to see that uh, long, strong demand. Uh, and you actually now got a booster in terms of the energy, you've called it the energy transformation. We, we did know it as the energy transition, uh, but it's now the transformation. So well done with, uh, with all of that. But it's given a great boost to demand for all of the things that we're actually in, involved in here and some new things that we haven't even heard the, or understand or pronounce uh, the names of some of the new uh, commodities that are coming through. Now, long, strong demand, uh, no worries, but you were bound to see humps and bumps along the way. No question about that. We're going through a bit of a slump and a bump, you might say, in terms of the equity markets and, and uh, so on and so forth, uh, but the direction and the force 
of that demand perfectly clear. So you're going to be able to see that. Uh, in terms of supply, Mitch, that is where the issue is. And we're all supply side people here, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, we add a little bit, a tiny bit to demand for all of those things, uh, but we do add a, a large amount of supply. So supply is where the, the problem is going to be. Supply is going to be playing catch up football now for uh, some time to come. But as you say, Mitch, the market always clears and therefore if supply you is... Say that. It, it, the, I agree. If the supply is actually having trouble catching up. You will see it. Uh, you'll see it yeah. in the price, and you want to be in those. From our perspective, you want to be in those commodities that the price is going to be under tension, uh, and that's what we believe uh, we're in at this time. So, very good outlook. Amazing uh, technology capability uh, and and financial capability. You know, just within this room and, and this conference and within this country and within the world, in a way. Uh, so, therefore, look forward to you know those fabulous opportunities, Mitch. Thank you, sir. Gabe, that's a good throw to you. Yes. So, copper's three bucks fifty a pound. Yeah. If you're going to bring on new supply, if it's not six to eight bucks, you're not going to touch it. Hmm. Maybe it's the markets are not taking it up. If you're not, if you're an explorer or a startup or a long life man, they won't mm. touch you. You're mm. so far off the radar, you're not there. Yep. Retained earnings companies are sending more back to shareholders than mm. their capex. Mm. Very few greenfields. I'm going to throw to you in a moment, Fiona, and say, how come there are so many brownfields expansions in coal going in New South Wales and other people are struggling in those areas? So that's a question I'll notice. Yep. So the market's acting rationally as saying, we don't actually think there's going to be a supply shortage. Either they don't believe the demand projections, which are almost inconceivable, or they think we're going to continue to do the supply. I mean, we've been, yeah. we, what a mate of mine said, we've been crying wolf on copper for the last 20 years and we still keep coming up with the supply. Yeah, I know. I mean, you know, um, you, you can kind of look at the copper price that uh, Owen mentioned before and, you know, you, you look at sort of those demand and, and future sort of supply projections and you kind of wonder where that disconnect is in the market. And I think what we are seeing is a real disconnect between the short-termism of returns and dividends and that long-term view and what we know is going to happen with the energy transition or, or should I say transformation now, have you coined that term? So, so um, you know, I think what is going to be a really interesting debate that, we're going to have to have with shareholders is what do reasonable returns look like in the, in this transitional period because if we're not having a fulsome and honest debate about what that cost of that transition and that transformation actually is, then I think we're in for a bit of a rude shock. We're going to continue to see the fragmentation, particularly in the short and the long-term perspectives. And I know, Christine, we were talking about that just before and, you know, how do you actually change some of the inputs? How do you actually make things quicker in the processes so that you can actually, I suppose, facilitate some of the supply coming on more quickly? And I know, did you want to give that example around the approvals that we were talking about just sure. before? I mean, as an industry, we often talk about the length of approvals, 16, 17 years on average, um, and you get the sense that it's, well, not quite an act of God, but something we don't have control over. The reality is that, in fact, we have huge control over being better organised and providing kind of higher quality information into the regulatory system. Um, I mean, I know that regulators... Uh, struggle with resources, but at the same time, they often deal with pretty patchy applications. Early attention to understanding your stakeholders, all of the things that feed into social licence. And for our industry, one of the great challenges is structural, because we have such a diverse range of relatively small players in the expiration phase that often don't have the capacity and the capability. And we kind of understand why, and expirations often episodic, but that gets inherited by whoever is investing to develop. And we know that therefore some deposits actually end up not being able to be developed. So it feels to me that there's not both an there's not an easy answer, but if we don't acknowledge that we're part of that, that our behaviour and the way that we're structured and the way that our investment happens contributes to the length of it, then we're never going to address it and change. That, that's a good segue. I'll come to you in a moment. If you like. Can I just follow up with that? In fact, you all jump in. So we, we've seen a shift in the vast pools of capital from risk capital being in the equities 
across the institutions. It used to be 80-20, now it's 20-80. The institutions, by their own volition, don't have the skills, the metrics, the capabilities to differentiate projects. So project execution risk is right up there for them because they actually don't know how to differentiate them. They're not looking at that, and so they're going with FADs. They're looking at ESG, uh, and they say, look, what is it? University of Queensland came out and said 70% 70, 70, 70 of copper projects failed for the incapacity to meet ESG they criteria. Stranded, basically stranded, stranded assets, yeah. and that was the, that's the market's doing that. Okay, everyone's talking about ESG premiums. ESGs aren't premiums. They're actually the price you pay to play and the price you pay to stay. And it's an opportunity cost because you look under your armpits if you don't have it. And, and so instead of looking for a rent on the ESG, it actually becomes a lead weight in the saddlebags to getting projects up. First point. Second point is in terms of the capacity, there's been a lot of flurry around governments being involved in critical minerals. But who's actually addressing the barriers to land access, to exploration tenements, to uh, getting your permits up? Uh, we've got sovereign risk and taxes and, and royalties and uh, all sorts of impositions. So your point about the regulator capacity, and I know you've got a view on that, is, is absolutely key and our contribution to it. But where's the reform agenda on the supply side that Owen was talking about? Well, I mean, I think the market's responding to their view of mis risk in terms yeah. of investment, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'd have to say that, you know, as, an, as a sector, we're not always our best friend, right, in terms of that being understood. And I think some clarity around going, you know, capital's really hard, we can't get it, and actually saying why is it hard, how do we address that, which gets back to actually, um, you know, the Equator Principal Bank started with this view about really needing to have ESG as a kind of early due diligence. And it feels to me we're a bit stuck. You want to tell us actually, about the Equator Principal well, Bank? I, I, I remember do, yeah, I mean, I it was a very long time ago, but it. anyway, it was really the first signalling for the financial markets and the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, to actually say we see the risk of actually failing to understand the location you're in, the environmental considerations, the sovereign risk of social, um, to be actually a go or no-go for some projects. And we're going to actually calculate that in to our finance decisions. I think a lot of that actually ends up now being focused on the quality of management and the quality of the organisation, the company, to be able to say, we understand these risks, we know how to, meet, to moderate them, we've got systems in place. And that's not a language we often hear very early in the piece, and I know some of my colleagues in the social space don't quite like it being called risks, but that's the market reality, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And with that risk, actually, if you get it right, comes the opportunity. So, you know, to me, there's a gap between the aspiration of saying we recognise it and actually really talking about what do we need to do and what do we need to change to address that. Can and, I you know, chip, can I, financial markets are rational. Can I chip in there? <laughs> Hold, hold that thought, I'll come back to aspirations. No, I was just, just wanted to chip in um, on, on that point. It seems to me that in going to the traditional mm -hmm. equity markets, which are now so dominated by institutional money, um, and of necessity they have to be um, cognizant of who their stakeholders are, who yep. their investors are, that we're probably looking at the wrong market for the risk capital that is needed to take the development projects and the exploration projects through into operation. Um, the people who understand those risks are the big companies and maybe what we need to start doing, and, and you know, when you listen to some of the stories out um, in the tent where the, the junior explorers are, they're going to the downstream um, yep. manufacturers yep. and the off-takers. And those guys have probably got more incentive and more understanding of the risk to be able to help those juniors get into production. I, I just think maybe, you know, we've moved from traditionally how those projects were financed. Yeah, great contribution. Can I keep going with you for a moment? So, Whitehaven Coal. Whitehaven Coal. And uh, His I was taken with, <laughs> I was taken with the fact that some of those institutional funds, uh, 
some time back said, we're out of coal. And then shortly afterwards, they announced a consortium uh, that they were going to fund the transition out of coal. Now, call me a skeptic, but that was code. For me, that was code for we don't want to miss out on those windfall profits. And at the time, way back, the, the green funds indices were 400 basis points behind the, behind the brown and the stock pickers had left them all in their, way, in their dust. That becomes a kind of reality check, doesn't it, to tagging ESG criteria without fully understanding the financial metrics and, as we heard in the discussion, the intangible metrics, which are still very, very important in the overall equation of things, but not readily accessible. And we heard the, the other day uh, that the Brownfield Project's approvals in New South Wales are very strong for expansion in coal. And not just, the, not, not just met coal, even with green steel met coal, but thermal coal. What do you say to people out there who've got the perception that it's dead, it's dirty, it's going away, rather than uh, actually, don't worry about the energy source, talk about how you reduce the emissions in the use. So if you um, look at where uh, a lot of that thermal coal is going, it's not, go I mean, some of it goes domestically and obviously there is a um, timeline on how long the domestic industry will continue, certainly in its current form, because uh, uh, domestic coal powered stations are old, old technology. But a lot of the coal, um, particularly in thermal coal out of New South Wales, is going offshore into Asia. And you look at the age of the uh, coal power plants that have been built in Asia, uh, in Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and increasingly um, Malaysia, uh, Vietnam. They are modern, um, ultra supercritical. Um, These are the heli plants? plants. Heli one, plants, yeah. the heli plants. Yeah, high energy, low emissions. High energy, low emissions. Almost so, the same as a gas fired power station in terms of energy efficiency, uh, what, 500, 550 kilogram CO2 equivalent per. They're, they're, they're producing, um, you know, 40% less CO2 yep. than yep. Um, what we're producing per um, energy unit here in, in Australia. So in um, those countries, um, those uh, modern power, coal power plants are part of their transition plans to uh, a low carbon economy yep. because they're replacing, um, you know, old old power plants. So let's put some figures on that. What, oh. six, seven of them at the moment, looking at three million tonne each? Is that about right? I, I, you've got the numbers. I'm, well, I'm they not... come from Mark. <laughs> Mark Vale, the chair of White, White, uh, what White, White Haven. Haven. Yeah, 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 yeah sorry, yeah. a senior's moment. Yes, um, that, that's 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 extraordinary, isn't it? So, so um, we see uh, that that uh, market will continue, um, and as far as uh, Whitehaven is concerned, um, the coal that particularly comes out of Moores Creek. Um, we see will be amongst the last man standing because it, it's high quality. Mm. And this is, this is not just our coal, it's, yep. you know, yep. um, Australian coal in general. It's going to be the last man standing because those, um, power plants in, uh, in Asia need high quality coal. They can't operate on the lower quality coal out of, uh, out of other basins. Let me shift gear and, and I'll start with you, um, Christine, if I can. Uh, but, but all of you will come in on this, given your legendary status. So Roe beautifully uh, uh, the other day said, you know, we're pretty ordinary. At the turn of the century, when I joined the mining industry, I, I couldn't believe it was as bad as it was in terms of its environmental and social stewardship. You know, I'm a farm boy and, and I just thought it was terrible. Uh, and it discovered the epiphany of sustainable development long before Wall Street got ESG. But, and that became the defining determination. We got through the ideas that this was competitive for pressures for the small guys who couldn't, you know, do social and environment. We got through all the stuff about discretionary expenditure. It became mainstream mm -hmm. and the people in that actually started reporting to CEOs and it's all, and we've come a long way. We've come a long way. And yet we still have these pressures on us 
about, you know, we're downright dirty and dangerous, and, and I'm not getting lost in logic around arguments, but it does beg the question that for an industry, and we'll get to the, the skills and what have you, for an industry that's talking collaboration, it's talking, talking multidisciplinary, it's talking culture, it's talking interdependencies, it's talking uh, interdisciplinary, and yet we're still very much a siloed industry. Uh, we're still very much uh, antipathetic to the whole determination. I'm not suggesting we socialise endeavour and initiatives, but I am looking. At, but the only thing I can point to in terms of where truly effective collaboration on a pre-competitive platform is occupational health and safety, and mostly physical, not even into the to the metal stuff yet. Uh, and, and we don't need to change laws for the for the abomination of uh, violence and discrimination and harassment. I mean, those are largely criminal activities. So it comes back to culture. So how do you think? Your experience, and I'm throwing it to all of you, your experience since the turn of the century to where we are today shapes us for the challenges of continuous improvement in the future. Look, I think it's been um, a, a bit of a roller coaster ride. So I think that um, there was a lot of work done around systems and processes and identifying skills and capacity and the development of sp some specialist um, skills in you know, particular areas, particularly community and social, that had not really been part of what mining companies did. Um, one thing we have learned is that, for those of us that in, were part of all of that, um, is that as soon as it became tight financially and economically, it was actually hard for some of that investment to continue. So things that I thought had been very um, much embedded within the business case and in the way that we operated... It came discretionary? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, if you look at what happened around the GFC and what happened around, you know, downfall in uh, commodity prices, uh, there was a whole lot of that capability that left companies. And, um, and you know, I think there's still a lot of rebuilding to be done and there are some really unfortunate incidents that have happened over, you know, recently that really came down to not having the right skills at the table at the right level, right? Because, I mean, this needs to be part of the executive group. This needs to be part of C-suite to actually understand and de-risk our operations and our development going forward, right? It's not a nice to have. There's a very real cost in terms of shareholder value of getting it wrong. And, you know, I'm not going to go over a litany of things where we've got it wrong because everyone in the room probably knows. Um, the other thing that we haven't done, and I don't know that we ever achieved, was actually identifying those skill sets that we should be building in for geologists, for you know, people, that, you know, mine planners, mining engineers, so that you're not actually kind of going, well, you're out doing exploration and someone should do the ESG stuff, mm. but that you've got geos coming out who actually have the skill sets that they need to be able to do it well. And it seems to me that's much more efficient. You keep jumping into the next question. Energy. I'm going to come Sorry, back to that one. No, 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 no. <laughs> can, I, no, no. can I just maybe Please. just add to that? Because I, that. I always like to think that, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time in this space really thinking around culture and how do you mm. change culture, um, you know, having run uh, operations before. And, you know, I always like the analogy that culture is actually like an elastic band. It always snaps back to the leader and what's really important to the leader. And I always wonder whether the industry really does enough to protect and support those people who are out there on the edge pushing the lackey band forward and really sort of pushing our industry into at times I think uncomfortable difference about how what we've how we can do what we do I I'm not sure that we do I'm not sure that you know when I when I reflect on the industry you know boards choose chief executives and MDs I'm not too sure how many are actually out there really driving change because I reflect on when I first joined in mining, there were some big personalities really doing things differently, lots of really bold people. And I heard a story the other day. Uh, it was about Albemarle, actually, and it was a bit about the history of the company. And I was listening to it reflecting that their origins was actually, they were, they were a paper company. They, they produced paper. And then at that, this is year, like 100 years ago, and then someone decided, the owner or the, you know, decided, okay, we're going to go off and we're going to buy a chemical company that's eight times the size of us. I mean, I'm not quite sure how many MDs and CEOs would be able to pull off a deal like that in today's world. 
And so I'm just curious about, you know, how do we actually make sure that we're not just institutionalising and doing the same thing over and over and over again, but how do we actually really step out and drive a different space? How do we actually become different? How do we actually get different people with different skills? It's not just about teaching geologists and mining engineers how to do social engagement. It's actually about, well, get the, get the social engagement experts and actually promote them to be the CEO. Um, how do we actually attract different people to to our industry full stop? Um, I think that's the key. I'm not sure that we've actually nailed that and that's what I'm really looking forward to in the future to see how much further we can actually push the boundary. So let, can I just throw to our own for a moment, if you don't mind? So you, you set up Sepon, Oxiana. Those of you who don't know, Sepon's up in Laos. And this guy was the CEO of Oxiana, and he went up there and he set up an operation uh, that is remarkable. Now, that would have taken a lot of the stuff that you were just talking about. First point. The second point is, very few of you would know this guy used to play for Essendon. So you know all about, you know all about team. And our industry is replete with people who are logical, linear, and rational. Most of them, when they think outside the box, they can't even bring it back in. They're brilliant. But they don't really understand the difference between competition and interdependency. Now, tonight you're going to hear at the dinner between two great leaders in rugby. And I hope they talk about the differences between competition where the mine manager and the mill manager smack the crap out of each other at the Christmas party because nobody's actually worked out how you do a dis inter interdependent KPI. And yet, the skills. So what's the greatest deficiency in this industry? I put it to you, it's people skills. But this guy, he put that stuff to work and built an amazing mine. Now tell us how you did it. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, Mitch, for that uh, question <laughs> there. Uh, I think there was a question there. Definitely. Yeah, there was. Um, how'd you do it? Definitely quick. A question, but but uh, Mitch, just just a couple of quick ones there, and picking up on a couple of the points that you've made, and also uh, Christine and Gabe there. Um, the first thing I want to say was going back to the the regulator, terribly terribly important here. We're talking about a, you know seventeen year timelines and so on and so forth. I mean that, that's going to we know all this is going to drive things out, and the price of copper is going to go through the roof, and all of this sort of thing. But you know we but. do have to bring it. We're going to bring it back again. We do hold the world record. We're claiming the world record over in South Australia for Prominent Hill from discovery to first production seven years, not yeah. seventeen years. So you know we've. Got to, we've got to return to uh, those sort of uh, days type of thing. At the end of the day, we're business people, we're mining people, we've got to follow the market, we've got to follow the money, and you've got to follow the regulator. So you've got to follow the regulator, the governance, uh, the customs, the practices, and so on and so forth. We're in the, in the country, the state, and so on that you are in. So you have to develop up those relationships. You can't blame the regulator. You've actually got to work with the regulator, understand the rules, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that that enormously clear to be able to build those sort of uh, relationships. Must be able to do that. Okay, so so therefore come back to the point about the um, uh, skills and, and uh, people and so on that uh, Gabe was making there. Got to do all that uh, and terrific work uh, going on. Terrific work and Mitch, you've been involved in some of that. Uh, work with the primary school, secondary school, tertiaries and so on and so forth, all the way through to, you know, being able to access the schools from offshore, must be able to keep doing that uh, type of thing. Uh, so great work going on there. And you, the point about the leadership, right? So, and again, this, this panel and a lot of people here, we're all in it one way or the other. We're all leaders here in the, in the industry and, and we all have that responsibility and ultimately accountability to bring uh, to bring people forward. You also made the mistake of mentioning football. And just, just one. He doesn't want to talk about the Geelong Cats. A couple, a couple of quick ones. I mean, we've all got our own, uh, you know, the eight habits of high performing people and we've got all these things and the five levels of, of leaders and so on. Got all those sort of things. These are the main characteristics you look for. I should, we used, in not used, but we embraced some of the key principles of one of our greatest sportsmen here in Australia, Ron Barassi, now hey, dearly the late, departed. The late Ron Barassi. Uh, and, and Ron actually was a great supporter of ours at Oxiana. He came up to Laos 
uh, and handed out and kicked the footy with various people. He came to Golden Grove in Western Australia, came to Prominent Hill in South Australia. So a great supporter, and he talked with people. We had Michael Long uh, over there talking talking to all the kids and, and so on in the, in the communities uh, there. But the three characteristics of Ron that I must uh, say here in terms of talking about leadership. The first was his absolute fierce determination and persistence to succeed under all circumstances. You must have that as a mining leader because we know the volatility that you've got to go through yeah. uh, in our industry. So you must be persistent and the great success stories that you've seen are not only the standout billionaires, so as to speak, but the leaders going back over decades and decades there of the mighty Rio Tinto, BHP, the big companies the small companies and so on, absolutely persistent and, and uh, determined uh, to get it done. Secondly, to actually bring on people, train people, coach people, mm. develop people mm. and bring them through uh, the business and br bring them for their own sake and for the team's sake. So great leaders do that. It's not for their sake, it's for the team's sake and for the company's sake. They, they will always uh, do that. And finally... Uh, Ron was a great innovator, never frightened to actually make change. Whether it's in the, whether it's during the game, first quarter, last quarter, uh, or whether it's during the season, or whether it's during the whole journey of the of the modern football game. So those three key characteristics you must have them uh, in in our industry and in this whole leadership group here. Thank you very much. What a great contribution! I interrupted you before. I can't remember what I was going to say. I think I was going to talk about culture after... Uh, well, please. Um, culture. Yeah. I think culture is ultimately so, so important. Poor culture will eat good assistance for breakfast every day, correct? Yeah, ab absolutely. So, and it's got to come from the top. Visible or felt. It's absolutely got to come from the top. And there is absolutely no point in uh, leaders paying lip service and ticking boxes if they don't believe in engagement, inclusivity, empowerment, and accountability, then forget it. Um, and if you look, in my view, at um, some of the problems that we've had in the industry, some of the embarrassments, it comes back to problems with the culture of the organization. Because at the end of the day, Christine talks about risk, you need people who are down in the pit, mm. and they're the ones who can see the risks, and they need to have the confidence to be able to say, hang on a minute, I can see a problem, I can see a, something that might be about to happen. We need to get people thinking about what happens if, not, oh, it, what do I do now, but what happens if. So we've got 11 minutes. Uh, there, are, there are two key topics I wanted to address, and I'm going to be a bit bold. I'm going to put them both on the table, and then I'm going to say, I think we'll do inclusive capitalism. We'll leave the, the systems approach. People who know me know that I, I'm frustrated to hell that we still talk about mining, engineering, metallurgy, and geology, rather than talking about natural resource development. We should be attracting people to our industry for natural resource development, turning natural endowment into societal capital. We should have all of those courses infused with social competencies, humanities, environmental sciences, ecology, so that when people come out, they've got a full-blown thing. Where did my experience come from that? Well, I'm actually an agricultural scientist. No, I'm not. I'm a rural scientist. And they were infusing us with that stuff back in the 1974 when one litre of DDT was good, two litres was better. So you imagine the cultural shift back then. And so I see this in our industry, and I'm frustrated. Now, I'm three minutes to comment on this. We, we failed. I failed terribly. The Minerals Council, the Minerals Tertiary Education Council, we get the institutions to take this on. The second issue I want to address, thank you, I got it. I, I can see the clock. Um, <laughs> the other one I wanted to address was inclusive capitalism. The whole concept of community engagement the shared in co-design, taking equity in what we do, how we go about it, and not equity just simply in returns and dividends, but equity in terms of the processes and the outcomes, both through the course of our mind life cycle. And if there is one example of how well this industry's done it, 
and I was talking to Vanessa about it, she was involved, is the way in which we shifted from that confrontationist and divisiveness stance through the Mabo and Wick debates to when Marcia Langton stood up in the Boyer lectures and said in 2012, and I quote the ABC, in this, the first of the series of the Boyer lectures, Marcia Langton expounds the virtues, uh, the benefits of the mining industry having made a greater contribution to the socioeconomic development and welfare of Indigenous Australians and puts this as a process of the thesis as being the model of the socioeconomic empowerment of all Indigenous Australians. 2012. The mining industry did that. Right? So, you've, we've got eight minutes and 47 <laughs> seconds. You can pick out of those whichever one you want to. I'm going to start with Christine, and you've got to keep it short, like right. me, and then over to you guys. And, and Owen, given that you've already made the greatest contribution I've seen from you ever, uh, we'll just come back to you last. Okay. Well, given that clearly I failed at something, thank you for giving me the chance to redeem myself. Well, um, uh, well you failed with me. I did. At least we did it together, yes. Um, look, I, I want to address the last one. I think some of the, that sentiment that came from Marcia, from Pat Dodson, from Mick Dodson, Mick Dodson from, yeah. you know, um, was really hoping that we were on a pathway somewhere. But the fact is we haven't quite landed some of the aspiration that came from that. And I think that is the thinking around moving beyond land access, jobs, supply chain access to really thinking truly about inclusion. As you said, what inclusion means what inclusion means right from the beginning. Um, so some of that's around the design and how we operate, but it's also about shared wealth. Yep. It's actually absolutely embracing that if we truly want acceptance, we need to go beyond the notion of soft benefit sharing. And I tell you, by the time you come to closure, people are adding up the balance sheet mm. and worked out what hasn't been delivered. Um, but really kind of saying, what could that look like? Wealth and for a First Nations perspective, absolutely, but this is true for regional Australia as well. One of the greatest myths is if you can't measure it, that it's not worth doing. That's garbage because there's art, you, you don't know what good art looks like either. You can't measure it, but you know when you haven't got it. So, uh, I'd like to make a comment please. as a tangent a little bit, but I think it's to your point, Mitch. One of the things, and I believe Stuart Matthew of Goldfields mentioned it um, in one of his panel sessions, that um, having good ESG credentials, having good culture is, has been for them the biggest draw card of getting young people to join their organisation. I will hold up uh, one of my companies, Bellevue Gold, um, mm. new operation, had to completely staff from scratch and um, has been genuinely driven by the passion of the former CEO and the current CEO on a, a real um, ESG pathway. The passion that you see amongst the young employees of that organisation and the reason that they joined that organisation is because of the culture, the inclusion and the ESG um, values that they're seeing lived every day. So I think, coming back to your point, um, we need to do this if we want to get Gen Z and you know, the the next generations into the mining industry because those are the values that they hold dear. Yep. I agree with that. Good. Well I'm gonna I'm gonna go one further on your you know your four revolutions that we've had. Mm. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put a forecast out there, right? So I'm gonna be bold enough to say that I think that the next cultural well the next revolution will be around social license to operate and particularly around people. So it will really come down to how work is going to evolve, particularly with AI. We haven't even touched on that today and no. the impact of what that is going to mean for the work of our workforce moving forward. And so that's just going to fundamentally change the way that we have worked. It will change the skills profile. So it will change the complete mix of what we're going to need. And I have a question mark in my mind about how are we going to attract those people when, you know, we get caught up in conferences like this and we think, you know, mining is the bee's knees. Well, it is a small, small dot. And very important, obviously, to the world's transition to a clean economy. But 
it is a small dot in a much, much larger economy and how are we going to compete with other industries, the Googles, the Amazons, those big tech companies, how are we going to compete for that skill base moving forward? I don't, I don't know how. It'll be fascinating to see. Well, let me put it to Owen. I think it will be, as a father of three girls and yes. seven, seven grandkids, and I'll put it to you, that when we start talking about environmental sciences, data sciences, data engineers, data analysts, that, that those kids, instead of just pumping out stuff from Amazon or whatever, they can actually make a contribution to societal capital and to communities that have a say, a part of the equation, the inclusive capitalism. I love that word. So, Owen, you know, you're, you're only marginally older than me, but you've, you've seen all this stuff come and go. <laughs> Look, uh, yes, yes, Mitch, no worries whatsoever. And as usual, I agree 100% with everything that everybody here has said. <laughs> Uh, just terrific. But of course, you will not get the, uh, the people and you will not get the capital and you sh unless you have de demonstrated multiple times that you are a, you know, your social license. You've got to attain it yep. and retain it and sustain it. You must have that. Yep. You must be looking after all of your stakeholders with the greatest respect. You build confidence and so on and so forth. Just, just terrific. It, it, it is, it is in our DNA and we, we need to, maybe exude more of it type of thing. So you must mm -hmm. have it. Actually, you must have it because the populations are increasing, people are more demanding, and they know more about things, you know, communications, revolution still going. So, you know, you m must have that. But Mitch, just going back one point, um, in terms of the, the, the cooperation and, and building the relationships up with the regulator and various others. The regulator, by the way, the governments here, and you know this very, very well, governments, we all have the same objective. It's sustainable development of our, of the industry. That's, that's what it actually is. And, and I have to say that the support, generally speaking, of the, the Aussie government, uh, and the Aussie states and, and most of the governments around the world, very, very good because they want that same thing too. The support very good. The cooperation here is just terrific. You know, think Geoscience Australia uh, and some of the cooperative work that's uh, going on in, in science and technology and so on. Just just amazing, you know. We've got to keep that up. We've got to continue to encourage it and, and use it and, and work it and, and keep our best in class, best in show, best in world reputation here uh, in Australia type of thing. So let's let's uh, keep doing that. That was my point. Thank you. Beautiful. We've got one minute and 44 seconds. So I'm going to, no, I'm not going to wrap up. We're going to do that. I want to hear from you guys and have a little bit of fun here. Okay. And I'm going to start with you, Fiona. What does it, no, you got to get the question first. Oh, I was going to answer because I've got something I want to say. <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. I would like, I don't know how many of you today went uh, over to the Fender Rock area and saw the primary school students and whether any of you went out onto the balcony and saw the Bright Stars uh, STEM program that they were participating in. But the energy of those kids, particularly out when they were playing with Lego and they, they had a virtual reality presentation that took them down into North Park's mine. Um, and the, the excitement of those kids, it was fantastic. And I'd really like to congratulate Tara Darman, um, of area and Shireen for making that happen. And we as an industry need to be doing more of that because we need to yeah, get those well, kids. Good understanding what we do, a, and they will educate their parents. That's a hell of a lot better intervention than my question, but we've got 25 seconds left. And Sorry. I'm going to start with you again. No, that was much better. I'll start with you again. So when do you think the supposed demand cycle is going to start to be manifest in the price cycle on the upside, and you've got 10 seconds to answer it? I don't know. Okay, Gabe. <laughs> Okay. You took my You're answer. Brave. I'm, not, brave. I'm not brave enough to put uh, okay. put something out there. No, no. Christine? <laughs> Look, I actually think that the energy, we are in transition, we want to get to transformation, is so disconnected at the moment that the crunch is going to come. I'm not going to put a time frame around it, but being on an energy generator board, I know how far the gap is. So at some yep. point, crunch is going to happen. It'd be quite nice if we're ahead of the curve. 
So there's a monumental reality check out there at the moment in terms of the gap between aspirations and capacity, and it's it's yielding unrealistic expectations. Owen, um, when I I got two seconds in in the turn of the century when Pierre Lasson came out when gold was two seventy five uh, bucks an ounce, he said it'll be a thousand by the end of the decade. At diggers and dealers. Diggers and dealers. <laughs> now, if you do the maths, as he did back then, which was to basically add up all the, the value of the paper currency out there and put it against the above ground gold, if you do that same maths, according to a bloke who knows how to do this, it'll be 20,000 bucks an ounce. Owen, are we going to hit $20,000 an ounce? Of course we're going to hit twenty thousand. <laughs> There's absolutely no doubt about that. Love gold. You can never have enough of it. It's it's actually it's a commodity. It's a currency. It's all of those things. Wonderful demand factors uh, going on it for sure. Uh, and in fact, we've just applied to make gold a critical mineral and metal because it's critical that everybody have some. Way to go, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Would you please put your hands together and thank these amazing legends? Yeah. You you have been very privileged to listen to their insights.